Okay, well, thanks very much <clears throat> for your attention. I'm going to take a few minutes to tell you about uh, a new tool that we're developing for the cotton industry. It's a smartphone app for scheduling irrigation. Um, a lot of the information I'll present today you can access by going to my website. You can see the URL at the top there, valitas.org. Um, if you click on the Smart Irrigation tab here, you'll find a lot of information about the app and some other things. One of the links on that Smart Irrigation tab is to the Smart Irrigation apps page, which is a separate page that we maintain. And I want to point out that the app I'll be describing to you today is one of a series of four apps that I'm developing with a, a team of colleagues from the University of Florida. So there's a Citrus app, all for scheduling irrigation. There's an Urban Lawn app. So if you're a homeowner anywhere in the Georgia, Florida area, you can use this app. If you're a strawberry grower or if you're going to be a cotton producer, you can use these apps. Um, these three have already been released. You can get them either on an Android platform or an um, or a, a, a iOS platform. You can go to this website and you can get the links directly to the stores. The Cotton app will be released in March, so I'll tell you about that in just a minute. These apps are going to be designed to be user-friendly. So that was the main overall objective of these apps, to make them engaging and user-friendly. And I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about our goals here because I want to spend more time showing you about the apps. Okay, all these apps are based on using evapotranspiration as the scheduling um, design. So what we're doing is we're using our weather stations in Georgia, Florida. The, the weather stations that the University of Georgia maintains, there are 83 of them, and the 35 that Florida maintains. I'll show you a picture on the next slide. So we're using the data from there to calculate theoretical evapotranspiration. We're multiplying that by crop coefficient to get the daily water use of the plant. And here's a picture of the networks. One of the most difficult things that we have to resolve when we're using this approach is the crop coefficient, which is the factor you multiply the evapotranspiration by to simulate what, what the crop is doing. So we've, we've spent a lot of time, Dr. Snyder's been very helpful in uh, helping us understand what the cotton plant does. So we've developed some curves that mimic the water use of the plant. And one of the things we've decided to do is that instead of using days after planting like many irrigation tools do, we're using accumulated heat units or growing degree days because if you have a summer like last summer where you have a lot of cloud cover, the plants aren't developing at the same rate as they did in a, in a fully sunny uh, growing period. So this determines um, when the plants go from one life stage to another and then the crop coefficient changes with that. So you can see we go up here gradually that we get to a maximum at about first bloom, we stay at the maximum point for a while and then we start declining as the plant matures. This is the operating principle of the app in general. We're doing a water balance method, so you can imagine a reservoir or a pot. We start out the growing season with a certain amount of water in the soil. The plant is pulling water out. We're adding water with rain and, with rain and irrigation, and we keep that balance. And so the ETC, the crop coefficient and the evapotranspiration is what we use to estimate how much the plant is pulling out on a daily basis. Measure precipitation and irrigation are key factors to make the sap work because if you have those numbers wrong then the water balance doesn't work, right? Um, so getting data from the weather station is something that we've automated. The app goes to these weather stations, I'll show you how in just a minute, and pulls the data automatically from them. But you got to remember that these things may be 20, 30 miles from the field that you might be using the app in. And so in the summertime when we have our convective rainstorms, you know, you might get an inch in your field, the weather station might report two inches or half an inch or something else. So it's going to be pretty important to, to sort of ground truth what's going on in the field compared to what the weather station reports. We have a, a young programmer who's fantastic at developing these apps. He's making them very user friendly. So here's a, a screenshot, let's say, of your iPhone with our four apps on it. If you're doing the Cotton app, um, the first thing to do is you register your field. You can do it two ways. You can actually be at the field and let your phone find the lat long, or you can just put in the lat long. So you, you name your field, you put in some information about the planting date, and then uh, the app automatically finds the closest weather stations to your location. And you select the one that you want to. So when I was fooling around with this the other day, I selected the Tifton Bowen Farm as the closest station because actually the Tifton station was down. Uh, I went to it and, and it wasn't reporting that particular day. Here are some other variables that are important. Uh, the rooting depth, we've actually changed this in the last few days to 30 inches as we make our final changes. So we're increasing um, uh, the rooting depth at about 3.3 .3 inches per day based on Dr. Snyder's recommendations to, 
to about 30 inches. We've got two irrigation system types built in. It's good for pivots and good for subsurface drip, although we don't have many people using subsurface drip yet, but we built it in. And it's also important for the user to enter the default irrigation of the system. So how much you normally would irrigate, an inch, three quarters of an inch, and so on. And I'll explain to you in a minute why that's important. Now this is a, a spreadsheet with a lot of calculations, which you probably can't see. But I just wanted to point out to you how the, the calculations are made with the apps. You have an idea. Um, so here's the days uh, as we go through the calendar. This is the crop coefficient that's changing as the plot increases. Here's where we get our calculations from the weather network in terms of evapotranspiration. We're using a five-day moving average of that evapotranspiration to smooth things out. We multiply that by the crop coefficient to estimate how much water the plant's using. Here's the rooting depth increasing. Here's our estimate of water balance in the soil profile. How much irrigation was applied? How much rain was applied? And then here, the parameters that the user would normally see, how much effective water is in the soil. So we're calculating a deficit. So you start out with a full tank, and then we're saying, okay, now you're losing water, and this is how many inches you're in deficit every day. And what we report is the percentage of that deficit, and we're recommending you irrigate when the deficit of your plant available soil water reaches 50%, because we don't want to stress the plant, we want to leave some buffer in there. So it's a very conservative approach. So if you were the user and using it, this is what you would see on your smartphone interface. Um, this is sort of the operational page of, of the app. Uh, here you see the deficit. Uh, here there are two color-coded columns, but it's not showing real well on this projector. But essentially you would see what the deficit was before it rained and then where it is now because of the rain. You see how much uh, the deficit is in terms of inches. You can see how much rain and irrigation was applied. And you can add or delete information based on whether you think this is correct or not. Likewise, if you had applied irrigation, there's a little icon here showing that you've irrigated. You see the same things. This is where the deficit was before. This is how much it, it decreased because you've added irrigation, so you're at 35 percent. That, that means that you're short about three quarters of an inch from having a, soil, a full soil profile. Um, so how much irrigation was added, how much rain was observed. This is an important button for us because we have, when we reach that 50 percent threshold, like you see here, the water deficit of the field is 65 percent, irrigation is recommended. The app automatically schedules an irrigation. In other words, it applies the irrigation, the default irrigation amount. If you didn't irrigate based on the app, all you have to do is say remove irrigation and it takes it away. It'll tell you I've applied an irrigation on your behalf. And this is just to make it easier so you don't have to go in there and add the irrigation. It makes it easy just to remove it. Um, if we see with some beta testing that that's not working out real well, we'll change that. Um, also at the bottom you can see the phenological stage of the plant. So where it's going, you probably can't read that very well because the projector is not showing it real well. But you, you can change these numbers as well. I'll show you on the next screen. So here's a, a, a notification. We're using a lot of notifications so that we can make this interactive and keep the user from having to go to the app every day if they don't want to. So the notification is that field one is approaching the first open bowl phase. So if you've been to the field, you can say, hey, this is right or this is not right, and you can adjust it here. You can physically adjust the phase of the crop. And that's important because the KC, the crop coefficient, is a function of the, the life stage of the plant. So if you've got a variety that's not mimicking the generic variety we have in the app, you can adjust it. So Calvin was good enough to do some studies for us uh, uh, this summer with some rep, rep, excuse me, replicated plot studies at the Stripling Irrigation Park. And uh, here are some irrigation scheduling methods he was comparing, including the standard extensions checkbook method, our cotton app, um, another index, and Irrigator Pro using watermark sensors. And of course, it was a very rainy year, as he told you just a few moments ago, so the rain fed plots did just as well as anything else. But we were sort of pleasantly surprised to see that our app performed the best. And uh, this is sort of the important thing, too. Look at what the checkbook method recommended in terms of water use and what the app recommended. This is for conservation tillage, the results here for conventional tillage. So similar results for both, uh, both approaches. George, I should mention, we did not, not irrigate. I mean, if it said irrigate, even if it was wet, we irrigated. For the checkbook method. Check yes, yeah, so Calvin is saying, for those of you that couldn't hear his comment, that the checkbook method simply is, you know, this is how many inches you need per week. And he measured how much it rained, and then he added the, the difference. So it doesn't take into account soil conditions. So that's the difference between the checkbook method and what we're trying to do is take into account what the soil conditions are. And that's why you see this difference. But if you, but if you had an inch of rain, did you take off an inch of irrigation? 
Are you saying you all, you're going to Yes, we always subtract okay. the rain yeah. clouds. Yes. But you know, in some soils, that rain lasts a good time. Um, but we didn't take that into account. We went ahead and irrigated when the next week. We kind of restarted every Monday. Yeah, so the checkbook is week by week. If you got two inches last week, the sort of erased. And this week, it needs two inches. You add two more inches. Um, of course, if people were really using that, they, you know, they would use some logic to it, Steve. They wouldn't quite <laughs> do it that way. <laughs> now, I want to show you really why the checkbook method and the app method and other scheduling methods are so different. Okay, these are graphs showing the soil moisture condition and the soil profile. And we measure these with the different system we've developed that uses watermarks that, that sends data back automatically. But if you just pay attention and think that this is going from wet to dry on, on the y-axis, these are two snapshots from the conventional tillage and the conservation tillage using the app. And you can see the profile is in the region that I consider good. So there's a sort of a green boundary here. Which the app keeps the profile in that green boundary. The checkbook method keeps it very, very wet. And see, so that's where you get your savings in water. And all good scheduling tools will do this for you. They'll keep it in the optimal zone, whereas here we're, we're very conservative. We're just keeping it wet to be sure we don't have any problems. Um, we also had a number of sites in, in southwest Georgia, in, um, producer fields, where we had soil moisture sensors. And so we try to say, okay, you know, we, we know this worked pretty well at the Stripling Park. What does it compare like uh, to real conditions in farmers' fields? So I have this graph here that kind of, if you can see, there's a red line and a black line. The red line indicates the average soil water condition at different locations in the field. So this is a particular location in one field. We had 10, 100 of these locations. So this is the average soil water tension at that one location in, in one of the fields. And the black line is what the app was telling us the soil moisture condition was. So you can see the patterns are very good. And this, is, this dotted line is the 50% deficit. And this is when our app would have said to irrigate, when we were crossing these peaks over here. And up here is rain. So there was a lot of rain and there's some irrigation in that field. But basically, we were very pleased to see that the app kind of mimics what the soil water condition was as we measured it. So we're very encouraged by that. So our next steps, and this is my appeal to you, those of you who are producers or county agents or consultants, I would really encourage you to take, get, a, get, a, get the app when it becomes available in March and use it this summer. And I'll be happy to give you instructions and come work with you to, to help you get it running because we want to get feedback from you to see how well this works so we can improve it for the next cycle. So if you've got a field, a special field that has some sensors in it and you can compare what the app is telling you to what the sensors are telling you, that'd be the best situation. So that's our beta testing that we're hoping to do this summer. Uh, we're going to continue doing some test plots at the Stripling Irrigation Park. We have an effort that's being supported by Cotton Incorporated to regionalize the app, expand its footprint in other words, because right now, because of its reliance on the Florida and Georgia weather networks, that's really the only place it works. But we're looking at techniques to expand its footprint to Alabama and South Carolina and, and perhaps across the whole southeast. This will require us to build specific crop <coughs> coefficient curves for each of these different regions. We're working with Dr. Diane Rowland at, at the University of Florida to build in some drought strategies. So when, if it's a really wet, wet year, you can use one approach. If it's a dry year, you can use a different approach to scheduling irrigation. And um, Dr. Rowland also has a scheduling tool for peanut that's similar to the one I described, and we're going to try and convert that <coughs> to a smartphone app. So there'll be one available for peanuts as well. Um, this is a big project. You know, it, it looks like some pretty simple work, but we spent a lot of time working on this. The key person in all this has been our programmer, whose name is Jose Andres. He's a young Brazilian guy. He's just brilliant at doing this. Works very hard. Uh, a lot of people at the at UF, at UGA, and, and then a new partner at, the, at Clemson University. And I think that's the end of my presentation about the smartphone app. Uh, can I take some questions before I move on to this next topic? Did Calvin study, did you, did you, did I miss it? Did you irrigate twice and to get three inches? Is that, or? On, on the uh, dry land? On, on, with our app? Yes. No, we were putting on three, quarter, uh, three quarters of an inch. So, so that was probably four irrigation events. Plus there was some. Dry land has some irrigation, but we just apply to it to mm -hmm. it and get it up. Right. George mentioned if you don't have a weather station nearby, what you could do. Okay, yeah, Calvin's saying, uh, suggestion of what you do if you don't have a weather station nearby. So even if you have a weather station nearby, you know, unless it's right next door to you, I really highly recommend if you're using the app that you try and verify the precipitation in your field with a rain gauge. Simple rain gauge will be fine. If, you know, if you don't have one, the rain gauge is the way to go. So you can have the nearby weather station that's collecting your ET data 
And that's good for a pretty wide region. Um, but it'd really be good to have a rain gauge uh, on your farm, and then you can just input the information in there pretty easily. On one of those screens, I didn't quite spend time in there to show you, but you can adjust these things by plusing or minusing, and it's very easy. You don't have to spend a lot of time trying to enter point numbers and stuff like that with thick fingers like I have. It's easy. Okay, so, oh, yes. Is there a cost for the app? <coughs> oh, good question. The question is, is there a cost for the app? Um, because the app is being... Uh, let's see, page up. Because the, the app is being developed with the assistance of federal grants, it's going to be free for the life of these grants. Uh, once these grants expire, then we're going to have to put in a maintenance cost just to, to do maintenance on it, but it'll be quite cheap. But for right now, the app is completely free. Thank you, good question. Okay, um, I've almost run out of time. I don't want to steal up Dr. Th Dr. Snyder's time, but let me try and, and, and promote this workshop that we're having here at this facility uh, at the end of February, and I've got flyers here for those of you that are interested. It's about precision ag, and the purpose is we're bringing in a lot of international experts that will tell us precision ag things that work all around the world. Um, and we have um, two hours of hands-on demonstrations at the end of the workshop where you get to learn about these things, you know, up close and personal, ask one-on-one -on -one questions. So if you're interested, p please pick up a flyer. It's right here in the front seat. And I better get off the stage because Dr. Snyder will not have that much time left. Yes. So there's no registration cost.